All right, so let's talk about the layered stress model. So the layered stress model is a theory or a, a theorem or whatever um, that Jay Jack and Chad Mackin, um, two, two trainers that I follow really closely, um, put together from various sources. So the layered stress model postulates that every aspect of a dog's life either contributes to or detracts from the overall levels of stress that that dog carries around as it navigates the world. So there's a lot of different things that can um, contribute to or detract from um, layers of stress in the dog's life that seemingly are completely unrelated um, that build up to a big picture. So just for an example, um, say that you dropped mustard on your favorite shirt. Um, now, if that was the only thing that happened that day that was unfavorable, then fine, no problem, we can fix that. Um, but if that day you were late to work that day because you had a flat tire and then at lunch the um, cafeteria or wherever you get your lunch was out of your favorite um, sandwich or whatever and then you settled on you know this other type of food that you weren't really stoked about but fine whatever um, and you had crappy meetings all morning and then you dropped mustard on your favorite shirt um, that's going to feel very different than the dropping your dropping mustard on your favorite shirt um, on a perfectly normal day. So there's a lot of things that can um, add to a dog's level of stress that it that it carries around every day that make very little sense to us as humans when we look at it, unless we're looking at it through the lens of um, what can we do to decrease the overall levels of stress in this dog's life. So. Um, this is kind of a, a big, a big focus that I have in my training. So everything that I do is kind of dictated by the layered stress model. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do to um, make our dogs healthier, um, to make our dogs less stressed, that really doesn't seem like it should make a difference. Um, so um, one example that Jay Jack uses all the time is undercooked meatloaf. So if I were to come home from work, um, and my husband had just made dinner and it was meatloaf and it was just a little undercooked. It wasn't quite right. Um, and I freak out, <laughs> freak out, start throwing stuff, um, just start yelling. The first thing that he's going to do is not going to be, uh, we need to hire a therapist to counter condition and desensitize you to undercooked meatloaf. Uh, that just wouldn't happen. Um, it just, that's absurd. Um, the first thing that he's going to do is be like, what happened? Like, something happened, what happened? This is not normal. Uh, but when we look at it like that with our dogs, um, say that your dog has um, problems with a very specific, um, Jay uses the example of a clown on a unicycle, whatever. You can, that can be whatever you want. Um, guys in hats or men in beards or whatever, kids on bicycles. Uh, say that they have that one problem with that one thing, um, our first instinct as dog people um, is to hire a trainer to counter condition and desensitize, get you, that dog used to um, clowns on unicycles or kids on bicycles or men in hats or men with beards. Um, so our first instinct is to address the trigger directly when really there's a lot of stuff that we can address before we even get to that point to make a big trigger, a very small trigger, or go away entirely. So I'm going to bring up here bear with me um it's gonna be a little trippy um okay so this is a layered stress model um so this is a a, a cartoon I, I don't know exactly who developed this um i would give credit if i if i knew um, but the bottom layer is is health so it's really important for us to look at our dog's health um as as really just the foundation of our work with our dog so just like with us we could um, eat Taco Bell for every meal and technically be fine, but we sure wouldn't be feeling our best. Um, so one thing that, that Jay talks about is um, who has considered that their dog might get headaches? A lot of people wouldn't even think about it, um, but headaches are caused by constriction of um, blood vessels in, in the brain. Um, dogs have brains, dogs have blood vessels, so dogs get headaches. So I'm not excusing, you know, any crappy behavior that you're seeing from your dog, but there's a lot of stuff that can go into it that you might not even think about. Um, so it's really important for us to look at um, physiological health of our dogs. So um, appropriate food selection. Um, I'm not going to get into that a lot, 
Um, but there's a lot of different sources that you can go to for um, food selection or, or appropriate food. So if you can feed raw, I generally recommend raw. Um, if you can feed a balanced pre-made raw or do it balanced yourself, um, and there's a lot of different sources that you can go to for balance, but it's really important that it is balanced. Uh, but if you can do that, I always recommend raw uh, because raw is the most biologically available source of nutrients to a dog. Uh, the more that we process uh, those nutrients, that we process those ingredients, the less biologically available um, those nutrients become. So there's nothing wrong with kibble by any means. Um, I feed kibble to my foster dogs and to my dogs when life get, gets crazy, but raw is the ideal. Um, so if you can do raw, um, do raw. If you can do it balanced and do it properly. So a lot of vets are going to be against raw um, because a lot of people don't know how to do it properly. So if you don't know how to do it properly, don't do raw, stick to kibble. Um, but select a high value kibble. Um, so high value is a very um, subjective thing. Um, <laughs> marketing, Blue Buffalo's marketing would tell you that they are the best kibble when really they're not. Um, that's just an example. I'm not, I don't have anything against Blue Buffalo, but um, do your research. There's a website called dogfoodadvisor.com. Look at that. That's a good starting point, um, but you do have to realize that the guy who runs that is a dentist. He's not a canine nutritionist. Um, <laughs> so the, there's a lot of different avenues that you can go down to look at your, um, your, the best selection for your dog personally um, for for raw or or kibble. So me personally, when my dogs are not on raw, they eat Purina Pro Plan. Um, that is my decision, my personal decision with my dogs. The reason that I feed that is because um, Purina is one of the few brands that actually employ veterinary nutritionists. Um, they've done feeding trials. They've not. They've done all that, and it's a high quality food. It's not like the top of the line food, but it's good. It's decent. It's it's a good one. Um, so that's just what I what I feed. But regardless, um, talk to your vet, talk to um, qualified human beings to give you advice on diet. Um, there's a lot of really good Facebook groups. Raw Fed and Nerdy is my favorite one. Um, check that out. They're all about raw. They're all about good good quality kibble, things like that. But okay, so that's that's the food. So uh, body condition is really important. So your dog needs to have good body condition. Um, so let me go to this other one here. All right, so this is a um, this is a body condition score. Um, it is branded Purina, but it doesn't matter. Um, it's very universal, so it goes from one to nine. So four to five here is ideal. So you should be able to feel your dog's ribs, um, but you shouldn't have to push hard to feel your dog's ribs. But you shouldn't be able to very very easily feel them or put your fingers in between them. So a good um, and, and ribs isn't the only like qualifier, uh, but it's a good, easy way to check. Uh, but the, a good test, let me bring this back here. I am so sorry, this is really trippy. <laughs> so a good test is your hand. So, and I have a blister from pounding fence posts. That's great. Uh, so if you are, I'm gonna have to try not to touch that, but if you um, feel the inside of your knuckles here, and your dog's ribs feel like this, they are too fat. So like I can feel my knuckles, but I have to push pretty hard. Um, and that's not healthy. Um, on the other hand, if you do a fist like this and you can feel your dog's ribs and they feel like this, they are too thin. A good uh, middle of the road is if you have your hand flat like this and you feel your knuckles on the back with a relaxed hand, that is what your dog's ribs should feel like. Um, now, let me go back here. I am so sorry. I gotta figure out how to do that better. Um, so I, you should be able to easily feel the ribs without pushing too hard, but you shouldn't be able to see all of them just as a, as a standard practice. So a lot of vets are the, a lot of vets have a, a wider range of what they would consider to be a healthy weight. Um, a lot of dogs are on the overweight side, but a lot of vets will tell you that that's fine. Um, and that is technically fine, but it's not ideal. Um, so I prefer to keep my dogs on the four side of the spectrum. Um, so ribs easily palpable with minimal fat covering, waist easily noted viewed from above, abdominal tuck is evident. So I want my dogs to be on the leaner side 
Um, so there's a lot of downfalls of having a fat dog. Um, their lifespan is actually shorter. Um, it's more wear and tear on their joints. It's more wear and tear on their organs. Um, it's just a lot of extra weight to be carrying around. It's harder on their heart and on their lungs. It's just not a good thing. Um, so your dog should be as lean as it can be while still being healthy. Um, so if you see like military working dogs or sport dogs, they're sometimes even in the three range. Um, they're pretty thin, but they're lean. They have a lot of muscle mass. Um, they're, they're useful. They're not carrying around a lot of extra weight and that's fine. That's perfectly healthy for that kind of dog. Um, for your dog, four or five is going to be where you need to be. And that's really, really important. So a lot of dogs that come in for board and train with me are fat. Um, and that's a problem. <laughs> uh, that's just adding to the overall stress of that dog's life being in not optimal physical health. Um, another, let me go back here. I got to figure out how to do that better. <laughs> Maybe I need another monitor. Uh, another thing is nails. So I am obsessed with nail care. Um, I think it's because I come from horses and um, good hoof is a good horse. If you have a crap hoof, you're not going to have a good horse. Um, so that's kind of transitioned into dogs. So nail care, nail care is really important. So uh, your nails, your dog's nails should not touch the floor. Say this is a floor. Uh, they should not touch the floor when standing on a hard surface. Uh, that is absolute minimum. There's no excuse why your dog's nails should touch the floor when they are standing on a hard surface. Um, and the reason for that is when they're standing on a hard surface and the nails are touching, that's putting a lot of pressure back up into the toe pads, into the, into the foot pads. And it can cause a lot of discomfort. It can cause the toes to turn. Um, it can really cause a lot of pain. Um, and there's no use for it. Um, even if your dogs do sports, even if your dogs do like weight pull, for example, a lot of people have really long nails on weight pull dogs. Uh, the problem is they can extend their nails, not as much as cats do, but they can flex their paw to get those nails to dig in. So you should not have your dog's nails touching the floor um, on a hard surface just standing flat. That is absolute minimum. Um, and like I said, the reason for that is because it's very uncomfortable if they are touching the floor. It's like wearing high heels backwards, or if you can imagine having your toenails long enough um, where you can put like corks or something underneath it that touch the ground as you walk, that would hurt because they're pushing your toenails up. Um, ideally, for most dogs, the goal is to not be able to hear them when they are walking slowly across a flat surface, a hard floor, like tile or laminate or hardwood or whatever. Um, that's ideal for a lot of dogs. That's the ideal for most dogs. If you can't get there, that's okay. Um, that is the goal that I stick to for my dogs. Uh, that is the ideal. Uh, because again, they can flex their paws to get their nails to dig in as they run or jump or do agility or something like that. But as they're walking on a flat surface, just easy walk, if they can hear, if you can hear their nails click, um, they're generally too long. So that's just kind of a, a, a general rule. So I have a lot of resources for nail trimming. Most dogs don't like it. You have to actively teach them to like it. Um, I have this whole series on my Facebook page um, and on my, YouTube, on my YouTube channel exactly showing you exactly how to condition them, what tools to use, how to know when you're too short, how to know when you're too long, that kind of thing. So look those up, please. Um, so let's get back to the, <laughs> let's get back to the layered dress model here. Um, so the next level up is lifestyle. So every dog, um, whether it is a mixed breed or a purebred, um, has the ideal life for that dog. And that ideal life for that dog, depending on its genetics, is going to look very different for every dog. So uh, a Border Collie mix, like the dog that's on the bed behind me, um, he wants to live his life chasing sheep and catching rats and doing all sorts of stuff like that. Um, he's a Border Collie, Terrier, something. Um, his ideal biologically appropriate lifestyle would be hurting things, chasing things, killing rats, um, just on the move all the time. That's not really an appropriate lifestyle for him to have. Um, but if I want to give him an outlet for that frustration of not being able to do those things, I need to find him surrogate activities to 
express that drive to do those things or he's going to show up with behavior problems. Um, so a, uh, a border collie wants to herd things, wants to chase things. A terrier wants to catch things and thrash them around. Um, some dogs are into conflict. Um, perfectly acceptable thing. The, the kid on the debate team is into conflict. The football player is into conflict. Conflict is not a bad thing. But if we don't give them an outlet for that genetically driven desire to have conflict, that conflict is going to show up in other ways. It's going to be, it's going to show up pulling on the leash. It's going to show up wanting to hold onto your clothes and play tug with your clothes. It's going to show up in some, in some ways that we don't like. And that's not fair to our dog to be upset with them for expressing their genetic need to do those things in a, in a way that is fine for them, but not fine for us. Because they have dog brains. We can't expect them to know what is an appropriate outlet and what is not. That's up to us as our human, big human brains. Um, we need to figure out surrogate activities to spin the same dials in their brain that their genetically driven desire to do things would spin. So like for Malinois, Malinois are uh, like essentially German Shepherds on crack. Um, they are super driven to do stuff. They like to bite stuff. They like to chase stuff. They were bred to um, as like protection dogs, <laughs> um, like military dogs. They're working dogs. They're just crazy, crazy high drive dogs. Um, if we don't give them an outlet for stuff, they're going to rip apart your couch. They're going to chase your cats. They're going to do all of these things. Um, if we can't give them the um, ideal, like if you have a border collie and you can send them to live on a farm, cool, do that, awesome. If you have a, a coon hound and you can hunt with them, do it. But most of the time we can't do that. So we have to find surrogate activities to spin the same dials in that dog's brain that the genetically driven desire uh, to do those things would spin. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we can do um, to build those into games, to build the things that the dog wants to do into games, to teach them what we want them to know. Um, so that's a huge part of my training. So think about that. Like if you have a dog that likes to chase cats or likes to chase cars, you need to kind of shift your mindset of um, from, you know, how do I get them to stop chasing cars to how do I redirect that genetically driven drive to chase cars into something that I don't mind him chasing um, and that I can use to teach him stuff. So we'll talk about that as we go. But that's the, that's the lifestyle layer of stress. Um, a, a less ideal lifestyle, a biologically inappropriate lifestyle, will cause a lot of stress for a dog. Um, just like the cattle dogs that live in apartments and people call me to fix them chewing up the couch. That's a problem. And it's not the dog's fault. <laughs> they are looking for a job. And if we don't give them a job, they're going to find one. And we're not going to like the job that they find. But anyway, so there's that. The next layer up is clarity. So clarity is an understanding of the rules. Um, what's allowed? What's not? What do we do every day? What's the routine? You know, how do I fit into, um, how does the dog fit into your life as a human being? Um, so dogs don't speak English, so we have to figure out a way to communicate with them in a way that they understand and communicate to them, what is your role in my life? Um, how do you fit into this human experience? Um, so clarity, a lot of people will do structure to provide clarity to the dog. So structure is um, a really strict management. So management looks like, you know, they're crated, they're on place all the time. Um, they are never really allowed to be free and make their own decisions. Um, and we kind of have to be careful falling into that trap because dogs don't need structure. Dogs need clarity and clarity is understanding that comes from structure, but it's not structure itself. So my dogs are at Liberty all the time. Basically, I hope you can see that. Otherwise it's not going to be effective. He's laying on the bed, just chilling. He's not in command right now. He's not expected to do anything in particular. I didn't tell him to go lay down. He's fine. He's made his own decisions because he has the clarity of understanding of what is allowed and what is not. So he has a framework to make good decisions within. But you can't start there. When I got him, he's a foster. He's been with me for a year and a half. He was very, very, very managed in the beginning. He was very structured in the beginning. Um, and so he learned how to make good decisions. He learned what the good decisions are, what the bad decisions are. So now he can make his own decisions and I don't need to babysit him. 
But we don't start there. We have to start with structure and management and things like that to give the dog clarity. But we can wean off of that. We have to be careful because if we think that dogs need structure, we're never going to wean off of structure. If we think that dogs need clarity and structure is a way to give them clarity, we can give them clarity and wean off the structure. Um, so clarity is when a lot of trainers get involved. So everything that I just talked about in the beginning of this video up until this point, most trainers will not address because it's not entirely evident that it's relevant, uh, but it is really relevant and it's really important. Um, so if you have a dog that is in physical pain with allergies or um, you know chronic conditions or anything like that and is on a crap diet and just doesn't feel good and it's a cattle dog and it lives in an apartment, you can come in and you can try to train them all you want, but unless you fix those things, you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to get the results that you want. You're not going to get the results that I can get. So, and that I do get on a very regular basis. Um, so clarity is important, but it's not the first step. Uh, but as such with clarity, this is when a lot of trainers get involved. So this is where a lot of the um, training advice that you see on online or given by trainers or whatever, this is where it starts to apply. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we can do with clarity. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we can do to communicate to the dog. What are the rules? Um, what are the boundaries? What are the limitations of your life? And how do you fit into this human experience? Uh, but we can do that um, without relying on structure long term. So that's the, the, the clarity level of, of stress. Next up is the leash. So I'm not gonna talk about this a lot right now. I will talk a lot about this when we get to the point where we teach your dog to walk nicely on loose leash, but the two minute version is 99.9% um, .9 of dogs see a leash as a restraint device because we don't give them any other reason to think otherwise. Um, so leashes suck. To the dog. So what, when we look at a leash, we see it as a ticket to outside adventures. We see it as a way to get out into the world and explore. Dogs don't see it that way. Dogs see it as a restraint device. They see it more equivalent to a crate or a box or a muzzle, um, something that is restraining them, is limiting them. So we have to actively teach them that it is a communication tool, not a restraint device and not a... Um, source of frustration. It's not a limitation. It's not a barrier. Um, dogs have issues with barrier frustration. It's the reason that dogs will um, like fight through a fence, but then you open the gate between them and they're fine. It's a, a lot of reason. It's a lot of the reason that dogs are leash reactive. So they're on the leash, they're barking and lunging and looking like they want to kill that dog. You unclip the leash and they're fine. Super common. Um, that is barrier frustration and that is what most dogs see the leash as. So we have to actively teach them that the leash is not a restraint device, it is a communication tool. Um, and the reason that dogs see it as a restraint device is because dogs' social bubbles are much larger than ours. So we try to fit, we try to force this dog that has this very large social bubble into a tiny little bubble that's moving really slowly. Of course, they're going to be frustrated. So we'll talk about that more when we get to the leash section. Um, and then lastly is triggers. So this is the clown on the unicycle. This is the kid on the bike. This is the man with the beard. This is the the little purse dog that's barking at them on the leash. You know, it's this is the thing that it's the last straw. It's what makes them blow their tops. Um, and this is such a small part. And, and this is something that most people start at. And it's not something that we should start at. It's something that we build up to. Um, because if we, okay, let's, yeah, let's go back here. Okay, so uh, the reason that we look at it this way and the reason that we look at this stack up, this, this buildup of layers of stress is that if we come in and we look at the trigger um, alone, that's only a tiny little part of it. And we're never going to be able to get that um, down below that dog's threshold. So every dog, when they're born, um, their genetics kind of determine what their level of what's their threshold for nonsense that they can experience before they start doing whatever it is that their thing is, whether that's excited peeing or submissive peeing or um, barking at the, at, the, at the person, you know, that's the trigger, biting or growling or showing whatever bad behavior or unwanted behavior that you, you're seeing. Um, that, that threshold is generally driven by genetics and that dogs 
early critical periods of development, and we'll, we'll talk about that more as we go, but um, the point is, say that on a level from 0 to 100, this particular dog, let's say this particular dog, uh, say his level of, his threshold is at an 80 out of 100. So if he is operating below 80, he has no problems, he doesn't have any issues, he doesn't bark, he doesn't, he's cool, he's relaxed. Say that's 80. Say that he's walking around every day, navigating the world at a level 70. We have 10 points, 10 stress points. Um, that's not a thing, I'm making that up. Uh, 10 stress points to play with before we start seeing that bad behavior. So if we can go through and we can minimize the health layer of stress, maybe that was a 10, now we can make it a 5. I'm going to be horrible at math, but you're going you're gonna to get my point. Say that the biologically appropriate lifestyle layer was at a 20. Now we make it a five because we give him a job to do. Um, the le next layer up is clarity. Um, maybe we take that from a 30 to a four because he had no idea what was going on. And so now we give him some guidance and he's totally fine. And so we just build these things up and say that his, his threshold is, is, is an 80 and he's walking around navigating the world every day at a 70. Um, say that we can lower that to a 40. Say we even lower it to a 60. Now we have 10 more stress points to be able to work with before we see bad behavior. So there's a lot of things that add up to um, just the overall levels of stress in that dog's life. And if we don't address every layer, every aspect of that dog's life that's adding to that stress, we are shooting ourselves in the foot and we are limiting ourselves out of the gate to be able to fix that dog's problems, to be able to help that dog navigate the world in a less stressful environment. So just an example, this dog, he came to me a year and a half ago because he was breaking out of crates and he broke all of his teeth off. Um, they're not broke off, but they're really worn down. They're just not a good thing. Uh, because he could not be kept in a crate, a pen, a kennel, nothing. He would grab the door and he would rip it back until he would break it open. Um, obviously, not a problem anymore. Uh, he was so frantically anxious that he could not sit still. He could not do anything. He always had to be doing something. He would eat their shower curtain. He would rip up on their couch. He was just a horrible, horrible dog. Because he had no clarity. He had no biologically appropriate lifestyle. This, they did nothing with this dog. And he's a Border Collie. He's a Border Collie Terrier mix. So he has these very genetic, very strong genetic drives to do stuff. And so they weren't giving him any outlet for that. Um, he was on crap food. He had no idea what the rules were for the house. Um, so he was a mess. He was an anxious, frantic mess. He's not a mess anymore. He's still got quirks, don't get me wrong. He's not a perfect dog, but he's a different dog now than he was because we went through and we addressed all these layers of stress. And the kennel, the crate, um, is the trigger. So if I were to have focused on just that, there's no way that I could have gotten him to where he is now, able to just chill, doing nothing. Because the trigger is just a tiny little part of it. If I would have, wouldn't have changed anything, um, we can counter condition and desensitize to the crate all day long, but he's still going to be a frantic, anxious mess because all of those other things are not being taken care of. So that's kind of a, a recap of the layered stress model. Um, a 30 minute recap, sorry. Uh, but it's really, really, really important to understand this. So what I would recommend you do is you print out this graphic, uh, the layer stress model, and stick it on your fridge so you look at it every day. Um, and the rest of the training is going to be kind of formatted in the um, to fit within the, th the framework of the layered stress model. So we're always going to be referring back to this. We're always going to be going back and saying, okay, well, what layer does this fit into? So there's that. Moving on to the next section.